Hello and welcome to the Microsystems Fabrication Laboratory. I am Shantanu Bhattacharya and uh, I'll be teaching today, I'll be, I'll be demonstrating some experiments on photolithography, which is a very essential component of uh, MEMS, um, for MEMS fabrication essentially. So uh, let's uh, go step by step in this. Uh, the first thing I would like to enhance and like to emphasize in such a laboratory is uh, that you have to be really maintaining the cleanliness. Um, and uh, there is a certain attire which is useful for uh, uh, processing and basically uh, one needs to cover um, in almost entire portion of the body uh, and take the proper safety measures so that uh, the particular operator in question who is doing the experiment is not affected and also the experiment uh, is done in a dust free environment. So let's look at the components one by one. This right here is uh, one of the fundamental components uh, used in such a laboratory. It is known as uh, the fume hood. Essentially it provides a class 1000 uh, clean space or clean area which is just underneath or behind this particular panel. Uh, there is essentially a blower unit which uh, circulates and causes a laminar flow of air inside this particular hood so that uh, typically all the dust which is around goes passes through a set of HEPA filters and the air is recirculated back and there is absolutely no entry of dust particles from outside uh, into uh, the, the, the clean space. Most of the uh, uh, dust particles exit because of this continuous laminar flow operation. So uh, uh, other components, important components of the fume hood is basically uh, an air track, a compressed air track which is uh, kept for uh, uh, the purpose of uh, cleaning wafers once we uh, process uh, these wafers. Uh, there is essentially a, uh, a water connection which is used for again washing samples as you do the processing. And uh, the very important component uh, which uh, is useful or uh, which is the most, uh, which is the primary component where all the processing is done is actually a silicon wafer. So the silicon wafer is commercially uh, manufactured by only a few manufacturers all around the world. One of them being MEMC uh, which is located in St. Louis. And essentially uh, the, the wafer manufacturers have uh, standardized processes wherein they produce different diameter wafers uh, including um, a, a 3 inches wafer, a 4 inches, 6 inches, so on and so forth. Now this right here is such a package or a box which comes from a wafer manufacturer and uh, it houses about uh, 30 to 40 wafers uh, in one of such packages. Let me uh, give you a closer look as to how the wafers really look like. The wafers are all stacked in as you can see here uh, in this particular fashion and um, this again is uh, packed in a super clean environment so that there is absolutely no dust on the wafer surface. So what we do right here is first take out a single piece silicon wafer and uh, I would like to illustrate how that wafer really looks like. So if you look at such a wafer, uh, so as you see here in this uh, particular fume hood, we have several components which we have kept inside. Uh, normally in order to uh, maintain the cleanliness of the process, we use these aluminum foils which you can see here is the silver. Uh, foil which is actually a clean surface and it is reusable. So uh, it's actually a one time use and throw basis. We can, I can actually uh, uh, you know cut several pieces and cover this area and keep it as a base and all the processes typically would happen on the top of such a foil. These components as you are seeing here, some of the glassware which is around or these tweezers which are meant for handling such wafers have been already cleaned prior to this and uh, heated in an oven so that you get rid of all the water uh, around it. So they are actually um, adequate for handling uh, these silicon wafers. So the first thing I am going to do is to actually unload uh, a wafer from its box and make a separate uh, container or take, take a separate container or a wafer box and transfer this wafer. As you are seeing here, this right uh, here really is a wafer box uh, which is meant for containing a single wafer. Uh, for microfabrication it is very important that especially when the wafer is moving between workstations we need to cover uh, the wafer adequately so that uh, we do not have any contamination as the workpiece is moving between stations. So in coating. Okay, so basically uh, the first thing we have to do here is to transfer the wafer from this box into a separate carry box uh, which is meant for holding just a single wafer. One of the reasons why we do that is that because we have to actually really protect the silicon wafer especially when it is transferred between different workstations. So this is uh, a carry box which is meant for that purpose. Uh, wherein there is a lid and then there is a small filter paper uh, which is covered at the bottom and this is used for handling wafer between workstations particularly uh, during the various process steps of photolithography. 
So we also use these uh, aluminum foils to make uh, super clean flooring while doing the processes. All the components like this glassware as you are seeing uh, has to be thoroughly washed and cleaned and then dried in an oven so that there is no moisture because essentially microfabrication is a lot about cleanliness. Okay? And so uh, we let us uh, transfer the wafer from the box here as you are seeing this is the wafer box. Uh, this process only has to be done within a fume hood because uh, this prevents the chances of the wafer getting contaminated by the dust particles of the air. So we take uh, a wafer out using a, a, a tweezer as you can see here. Tweezer also is a very clean uh, tweezer and then essentially we use this box to load this wafer and later on all the handling will be done uh, using this particular box uh, in the subsequent process steps and then cover this uh, with the lid. Okay. We uh, close the silicon wafer box and keep it in a separate area. One of the reasons is that we have to be extremely careful while handling silicon wafers because uh, they are very fragile and essentially can crack even on little impact or stress. So we have to make sure that this wafer box is far away from the experimental setup, at least the main box is far away from the experimental setup. So the next step uh, basically is the clean wafer, although it is uh, very, very clean, but we still need to do a surface treatment of the wafer so that uh, number one, it can be made hydrophilic. Number two is that uh, whatever organic contamination is there on the top of the silicon wafer gets removed. So one of the methods of doing that is by using an acidic uh, solution called pirhana, which is essentially a mix of hydrogen uh, H2SO4 or sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide. Um, essentially the pirhana is uh, prepared by mixing three parts by volume of sulfuric acid uh, with one part by volume of H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide. It's a highly exothermic process and results in a lot of heat release and fumes. And once the solution stabilizes a little bit after mixing, we typically use a glass rods to stir the solution and put the wafer on the solution and clean it for several minutes, about six to seven minutes, so that everything which is organic on the top goes away. And then the idea is to kind of extract the wafer back and rinse it using DI water for a few times so that you can remove the acidic impurities and then dehydrate it is in an oven set at 95 to 100 degrees Celsius. So let us look at that process now. Pirana is a very dangerous process as you as I have already illustrated and therefore you need to use a special protective covering. We are already wearing a safety glass uh, as you have seen before. And now what I am going to do is to wear a set of polypylene gloves. Uh, these are acid resistant essentially and highly anti corrosive and it uh, essentially prevents uh, any kind of uh, damage or contamination to the operator if, in case of spillovers. As you see here, uh, uh, you know you can just wear it over uh, the, the secondary gloves that you are already wearing uh, to, uh, and which is a clean gloves and for doing processing. Once this is one, uh, we are almost ready for preparing the Perhana solution. So what we do is uh, basically pour about, in this case about 90 ml of sulfuric acid 98%. As you can see, there is a very, very dangerous chemical and uh, it has to be very carefully used. And then we will mix about 30 ml of uh, hydrogen peroxide. So uh, what we do here is the following. We use uh, all this spill, uh, all this pouring, etc. over the drain so that in case there is a spill over, everything goes down the drain. Okay? So essentially uh, opening this sulfuric acid bottle is also to be done very carefully. You uh, use these gloves. So basically you open uh, the, the acid bottle and keep the cap in safe place, safer area and uh, essentially now what you do is basically take this bottle and pour it in this beaker here very carefully and very slowly. As you are seeing here pouring this is not a very easy job do it just about close to 100 ml okay and essentially again keep this back in its place cover this properly so that there is no chance of any spillover and uh, essentially close the lid okay and we need to actually do a secondary measurement to ensure that the volume uh, that you are using is proper so use uh, a measuring cylinder for that and we need to pour exactly 90 ml here. So what we will do is we will transfer this sulfuric acid into this measuring cylinder and go all the way up to 90 ml. Just 
is just about complete now. So, we take a new container in which we have to prepare the pirhana and slowly pour from the measuring cylinder the sulfuric acid. One thing we have to ensure is to identify the components which have already been used for containing sulfuric acid because we have to wash them later on properly uh, so that there is no risk of uh, uh, any experimentalist getting burned because of improper usage of that. Now we have to pour about 30 ml of hydrogen peroxide. So this right here is uh, the container for H2O2 and the reaction is essentially an equilibrium reaction where there are a lot of hydrogen ions and hydroxides which are generated and uh, essentially it is an equilibrium process uh, which coats a layer of hydroxide onto the silicon uh, dioxide, the nascent oxide surface and also uh, creates a lot of heat. Okay? Uh, so, basically we need 30 ml of uh, hydrogen peroxide. So, we open this and pour exactly 30 ml of hydrogen peroxide into the secondary container here. and keep it separately in this particular zone. Okay. We close this because it is a highly uh, volatile material it kind of evaporates and so we need to ascertain that uh, it comes back in its safe zone. So, after we have independently poured these uh, we had to mix these two chemicals together in this beaker and what I am going to do is to now turn on the fume hood essentially because uh, this is a very very exothermic reaction and essentially we have to also pull down the cover uh, just about to a level where you can just put your hands inside and do the operations. So, essentially now you will be pouring uh, the hydrogen peroxide into the sulfuric acid this is a very critical part because this may actually explode. So, as you see when you pour the material there is immediate reaction which takes place and there is uh, a lot of fumes which are generated as you can see and this fume has to be done in a very very close environment and uh, we have to wait for some time till this fume actually disintegrates or disappears totally and pirhana is made in that process. So, as you can see the fumes are slowly settling down because uh, essentially it is a very very uh, highly exothermic reaction. So, what you do now is to actually use uh, a glass rod and stir the solution very well. So, that the mixing between the hydrogen peroxide and sulfuric acid takes place and then once this is ready and mind you this is a very hot uh, chemical and essentially you have to be careful while even pouring it into the separate petri dish as uh, I will just illustrate in the next step. This is a glass rod you cannot really use any other metal rod for doing this because the acid immediately uh, produces the salts from the metal and uh, it also deposits the metal uh, and, and takes it off and you know in the process gets contaminated. So, you have to always use a glass rod or a glass container for doing this pirhana making. Uh, process. Once this is made you uh, rinse off the excess pirhana on the glass rod and keep this rod back into the container for H2O2 and this would later on be clean before we can reuse uh, this uh, again. And so, what we now do is essentially take uh, this pirhana what we have prepared and then pour it over our silicon wafer which we will be keeping in this particular petri dish uh, separately. Okay. So, what we do is essentially uh, 
we take our wafer silicon wafer and uh, open this and clean in order to clean this wafer we put this wafer back over the petri dish here as you can see here uh, we are putting the wafer in this petri dish okay and once uh, we pour the pihana we can no longer use this metal tweezer for uh, handling this wafer so we'll have another separate teflon tweezer for doing this wafer handling once it's out of the pihana uh, for washing and rinsing okay so now we slowly pour uh, this chemical the pihana over this wafer and uh, you know it is extremely hot as you can see and essentially uh, it also fumes as you pour it and uh, immediately if you can see uh, there are uh, the organic contaminations over the, uh, the silicon surface has been immediately removed and uh, we store all this container later on for cleaning and using it okay for different applications so now we keep this close and wait for about 10 to 15 minutes so that the wafer can totally get uh, rinsed. So these as you see are now teflon coated these tweezers have tips which are coated with teflon or they can be complete teflon tweezers which we are which we can use so what we are going to do is to provide a normal rinsing using distilled water as you can see here which is resting in the flask of this particular uh, pirhana clean wafer sample and then this will be followed by another wash of di uh, deionized water uh, so that uh, it uh, gives a super clean uh, surface on the wafer so what we do is we basically pull it out very carefully because essentially this is all acid coated now and one has to be very careful and then hold this over this edge and uh, rinse it inside this with water and rinse it on both sides as you can see all the water should typically go and rinse all the acid off the surface of the silicon wafer and uh, essentially once this is clean the, at the, in the next stage what we do is we take this DI water and slowly rinse it on the surface of this particular wafer as you can see here uh, this is uh, actually a squirt bottle which is squirting away the di water on the top of the silicon wafer so essentially after completely rinsing it you basically uh, try to uh, just change its holding location to a different area so that you can rinse off the acid in the particular area where it was held before and this way you can clean the whole sample and uh, essentially you can see now that the sample is more or less thoroughly clean, thoroughly washed and it has a super clean nature on the surface. So once this is totally clean, we need to now use the compressed air to dry this particular wafer. Uh, but before doing that, we need to take care that the acid etc which is actually uh, kept in open needs to be kept away so that there is no squirting of the acid in general. So now you, you take it. So this is basically a, a, an air nozzle, it actually sends in compressed air and what we are going to do is to actually slowly use this nozzle to clean off the surface water as you can see here slowly from the surface. Okay? Uh, so essentially you have to move this thin film of water in the uh, clean hood uh, away from uh, the side so that you are actually left with a clean surface of the wafer, a clean shiny surface of the wafer and there should not be any water drop uh, in this manner on the surface typically all the water film should go 
away from the surface. Similar cleaning has to be done for the reverse side and I am going to do that as you see here, seeded from the compressed uh, nozzle side towards the other side and it is then rinsed off the surface by squirts of compressed air as you can see. Okay? So this now really is a super, super clean surface for lithography uh, to take place. So we put this uh, sample, this clean sample. Back into the wafer box as you can see. And then we will actually do a heat treatment of uh, this particular wafer. So that it can get rid of all the water from the surface. And uh, that way we have a completely dehydrated surface. We need to cover it at this stage because the moment we move it out of this clean area, it can again become dusted and the contamination of the surface may happen. So this is how the Kirana cleaning process of the wafer is done. So basically what we do now is to take this wafer uh, that we just made uh, super clean using Pirhana process and take it to an oven. The oven basically that we are using here is a gravity fed convection oven which actually um, is based on the principle of uh, free convection, uh, there are a set of heated coils at the bottom and uh, there is a current of uh, air, heated air, which actually makes the temperature uniform. There is a PID based controller using a thermocouple which is somewhere at the floor uh, of uh, this particular heater. Uh, this right here is uh, uh, that oven. So what I am going to do is to illustrate a little bit about this oven and then basically uh, use this oven to heat dry the wafer surface. Uh, so basically. If you look at this oven really, it is uh, a shelved oven as you can see, uh, the, uh, there is a fan which actually does force convection uh, along this whole area and uh, essentially uh, the wafers are kept at various levels. The thermocouple is somewhere at the bottom, that is one uh, disadvantage of this particular type of oven because it sometimes is not a very good indicator of the temperature that happens. This right here is a controller, it is based on proportional integral differential controller. So as you see here, there are two different readings. There is a set point and then there is a variable point where the temperature goes up and down based on what the set point is. In order to control this, basically, if you, you, you can see here, right here, there is a set option. So you press the set option and then take this up arrow or down arrow. And as you are seeing, the figure here, which is the SV or the set value is varying 89.3, 0.4, 0.5, 0.6, so on and so forth. So we take this all the way to about 100 degrees, which is important for proper hydration of the wafer surface and once you uh, reach 100 you basically leave uh, the set key and this is now set at 100 degrees. So this temperature which is also the, the proportional, uh, proportional integral differential temperature is actually slowly uh, equalizes the set value after a while uh, and uh, basically there is some kind of a, a flickering around the set value. It uh, does that flickering and slowly attains uh, the set value point. So basically now as you are seeing here, the, the variable value is have, has almost reached 100 degrees and this is uh, time enough for our wafer to get loaded inside and get dehydrated. So what we basically do is uh, essentially take the wafer box which we pulled out of uh, the fume hood after the pirhana clean and then basically uh, put an aluminum foil on the top of one of these uh, shelves and then slowly load our wafer sample so that we can uh, get it heated and remove any water if present on the surface of this wafer. And uh, the whole idea is to have a perfectly dehydrated surface of this particular wafer so that um, uh, it can be good for adhering to the photoresist that we essentially spin coat on the top of it before doing photolithography.
So we keep the wafer in the oven the, for dehydration for about 10 to 15 minutes uh, at about 99 to 100 degrees Celsius. And the next step is to unload the wafer and start doing what we call spin coating of the photoresist. So what I'm going to do is to just unload it and carry it back again. Please note that we are using the same wafer box for carrying the wafer. Again, from the, uh, for the constraint that it should not get contaminated while going between operating stations. So we slowly use uh, the tweezer, uh, which was again uh, used for the other processes. This is again a clean tweezer. And we uh, slowly pick up this uh, wafer from the oven, transport it into the box here, and then convert this or, or cover this with the lid. Uh, so basically now we have a clean wafer which would take to the next station which is actually the spin coder where we will be doing the resist coating. So the next stage basically is spin coating the photo resist and for spin coating the first thing that one needs to take care about is the grade of resist that one is using. Uh, there are many manufacturers of uh, resists in the world. Uh, we will be doing negative tone photo resist here uh, which um, basically means that wherever light uh, or UV light uh, is used for exposure of the water resist film, there would be a general cross bonding among the molecules and the resist stays back and uh, the portions which are unexposed can be developed off. So really what you would have is basically small features translated from the masking, mask design onto the resist surface uh, and wherever light has fallen through the mask window onto the resist, the features remain, the other portions, uh, the features go away after developing. So the first thing that is important here is to download the specifications of uh, the particular grade of resist that you plan to use. And what we normally do is we use uh, a resist from Microchem, uh, which is actually a resist maker. And uh, essentially, uh, we are using a grade of resist called 2025 SU8, which is a certain viscosity. And what the resist manufacturer really does, he really puts together an experimental curves for this particular viscosity and so basically what he determines is what is the RPM at which we should spin the resist so that a particular thickness can be achieved and thickness defined by the RPM is really thickness of the feature that we are looking at. Uh, the, what it also does is it actually mentions about uh, the temperature steps that you need to is, uh, include in order to process uh, the resist once it has been spin coated and also after the exposure. It also mentions specifically about what is the exposure dosage which is needed and what is the time for which the resist needs to be exposed so that uh, it can have enough cross linking and cross bonding. Just at the outset I said this process of photolithography is about developing cross bonds between different molecules and that is essentially driven by reaction chemistry and has a certain rate. So it is very very critical for us to be able to determine how much temperature is needed, what is the time point or what is the time of holding for that particular temperature step. Uh, also uh, we also need to a certain uh, what would be a typical exposure dosage for all the molecules within that small window to get exposed so that they get cross linked very well. So essentially uh, I would like to go ahead and make features which are about 20 to 20 microns thick and for doing that if you will see at this resist grade sheet you basically get these curves here where it talks about what is the RPM uh, uh, on the x axis here and what is the corresponding film thickness that you will be getting. So when we are using a certain grade here which is mentioned in this table here as you see, so SU8 2025 which is the lowest grade here is really corresponding to a curve which is the least this curve essentially here. And so corresponding to about 20 to 25 microns what we find out is the RPM that we would need for this is about close to 3500 RPM. So I am going to in just about in a minute set up the spin coater that we have here and uh, tell you about more about how to program this machine so that you can have uh, the particular spin speed at a particular RPM uh, and you can also be able to hold it at that spin speed for a certain amount of time. This right here is uh, what we call the spin coder. Essentially if you look into this machine closely, you have a spin stage which is represented here, which, uh, which, is, which is here in this area. Essentially uh, the principle uh, is you use vacuum for holding the wafer onto the spin table. And uh, if you look closely into this particular area, you have these grooves here uh, which are actually crisscross and they are placed over the whole periphery of the spin stage. And the purpose of these grooves are that uh, there is a vacuum track immediately below this which is connected to a vacuum pump underneath this whole system. And uh, essentially the vacuum propagates all the way up through this small center hole here 
and then also propagates along these grooves and kind of holds together the wafer on the top of the surface. What is also important for me to tell you is that there is a control uh, which is here for which we can actually use for flexibly controlling the spin speed, uh, also the amount of time for which we can hold at a certain speed and also what is very critical uh, for different grades of resistance the, the acceleration at which you can rotate in order to achieve a certain speed. So here in this particular example what I will be demonstrating uh, as per the resist manufacturer specifications the spin speed that we are using is about 3500 rpm and also uh, you know the spin speed has to be uh, attained with an acceleration of about 300 rpm per second okay and uh, what it also mentions is that you have to hold at a certain spin uh, speed for about close to 90, 90 seconds for uh, the spin coding to be uniform. I would also like to illustrate here that the resist being a thick material needs a little bit of time for uniform coverage over the whole surface. When we are talking about a circular wafer, what is very important for us to understand is that, uh, you, the, first of all the resist that you are putting should be sufficiently covering the wafer, uh, so that you know once the, so what is uh, also very important for me to illustrate here is that really what we are doing is to uh, spin the resist on the top of this circular wafer which is about 4 inches or so. And we need to be able to ascertain what is also very important for me here to illustrate is that you know uh, the particular uh, spinning operation should be able to adequately cover the whole uh, wafer surface. This is a circular wafer of about 4 inches diameter and uh, the goal here is really that the resist should not have any gaps or any islands on the surface as you are spin coating it. So you have to ascertain how much area you need to initially pour or cover so that you have enough resist so that uh, essentially spinning process is nothing but centrifugation. Uh, there is a slow uh, coverage of the surface of the resist which has been poured somewhere in the center uh, by centrifugal forces. Okay? And so uh, the whole idea is that you cover adequately and give adequate resist so that when it goes radially in all the directions it should be able to have uniform coverage on the surface. So for doing this uh, what we would need to uh, find out first is how to set up the controls in the particular spin coder and how to control the RPM time, the RPM per second rates, etc. So let us look at that in our next step. And corresponding to this program number, what all steps uh, are there in the program are illustrated just uh, in this particular region. So as you are seeing here in this, in the run mode, uh, the step 1 of the program illustrates that there would be an RPM of 3500 RPM, which is attained at an acceleration of 300 RPM per second and uh, the time of hold for this is about 180 seconds and uh, this is with an option of vacuum um, operated so that the wafer is pulled down while uh, the, the spinning happens and then finally um, you have to uh, somehow change this program to suit to your requirements. So what uh, we essentially do is uh, to first use uh, the, uh, the, the program mode here as you can see to go to the number of the program. Uh, suppose we want to make a new program here, so we find out the or we, we give a new number here, let us say we want to make program 7 okay? and then we try to see or we try to illustrate what is there in program 7. So we go to the mode option here, so basically what we now do is after we have entered program number 7, uh, we enter this program and then go to the mode option so that we can get a detail of what all steps are involved in this program. So here really uh, the program is about step 1 and only it is a one step program and followed by the end of the program right. So it is one end. Uh, now what we do is basically move to the next option here and uh, we get this RPM uh, which is actually 2000 in this particular case as you can see. So what I am going to do is to change this to uh, 3500 which is our requirement and uh, we can actually hit enter here for the system to take this and the time for which we need to hold this RPM is about 90 seconds. So we do 90 here and then enter the data and the next step is what all uh, revolutions uh, uh, per minute per second we need uh, this speed to be. So we put uh, uh, the value for the acceleration 300 uh, and essentially enter this value and uh, uh, for our condition we need the vacuum to be on while the spinning is happening. So we just take whatever is the default and that completes pretty much. Uh, the program. Okay. So all we need to do is to now actually put the wafer back to the spinning stage after which 
we will be doing the run operation. So, what I am going to do now is to actually simply load the wafer onto the spin table uh, and then we have to also see whether the wafer is actually centered which I will do a little bit, a little bit later. And uh, what I do is I just turn on the vacuum, you can see this light, the green light appearing here which means that the wafer is now firmly held to the surface and it cannot come out and it is basically clamped pretty firmly onto the spin table. Okay? So, now it is almost ready to rotate and spin and uh, essentially uh, coat whatever is there uh, on the surface of the material. So, we would like to also have a look as whether this wafer has been centered and the best way to do that is to close the lid and see from this transparent section on the top whether this wafer is really at the center of the spin table. In case it is not then you can switch off the vacuum and again and again change the position in a manner so that the wafer can come pretty much at the center of the spin table and uh, the thing which we are ensuring here is that uh, uh, there should not be any wobble really of the wafer and it should uh, actually rotate at its own axis, uh, axis and uh, so it should rotate at its own axis and uh, the, that, that can ensure that there is no um, you know under utilization of the resist which is at the very center of the particular wafer. So, basically we have now placed the wafer and uh, essentially what we need to now do is just turn on the vacuum here, the light would come on uh, as you can see here, this is in the on mode. So, basically the vacuum pulls the wafer so that it can sit onto the spin stable and then we have to also see whether the wafer is centered and the way to do it is basically close the lid of the spin coder and turn this RPM on so that the system actually starts rotating and see from this top transparent area where there is any wobbling in the particular wafer. Now, as I can see here from the top, uh, the wafer is more or less centered and uh, there is very less wobble. So, I really did not do anything about position of the particular wafer. So, I am going to switch this on to see the wafer is moving inside spinning and uh, essentially there is very less wobble and we can do with it with this kind of a wobble. So, I am going to now spin coat the fodder resist on the top of this wafer by pouring the resist and then doing all this execution of the RPM cycle and the moment the, uh, the resist is spin coated. We also need to take this now for the twin step uh, heating process uh, which I am going to describe in a little bit. So, the resist as I told you needs to be heated and one of the purposes why heating needs to be done is that uh, there is a solvent which is really a carrier solvent for uh, resist. It has really um, an epoxy resin which is uh, dissolved in a carrier solvent which is actually cyclopentanol and uh, essentially uh, but the purpose is really to transport the epoxy uniformly over the surface of the wafer in the spin coating process that we saw last uh, in the last step. And uh, then we need to get rid of this uh, solvent because essentially that would ensure that the resist film is stable, it is hard enough, it is uh, kind of equibonded and uh, before doing exposure it is very critical because the mask would sit on the top of the resist. Okay? And so therefore, if there is some undried portion or uncured portion. Uh, the resist is going to get damaged and that is something that we do not want because that would mean that our surface of the micro features that we would result I mean that it would result in will also be damaged because of that process. So, we need to ascertain that um, uh, the, the resist is fully cured before taking it to the next exposure step. Now, I would like to illustrate one uh, fundamental factor here is that we all know that because of uh, heat addition there is a thermal expansion and this is the thin film we are talking about the resist is really a thin film. And so, there may be a, a rapid due to rapid heating or uh, rapid cooling there may be a tendency of the resist film to warp over the surface and create undulations and that is something that we want to avoid too because we need to be as much planar as possible for the surface uh, integrity or, or for the structures integrity to be maintained. And so, uh, it is really a good idea to heat the resist in a stepped manner, heat it at a lower temperature maybe about 65 degrees or so and then heat it to a higher temperature. So, that it is uh, adjusted enough and there is no undulation or warping of the film as such. So, therefore, uh, we use hot plates for this purpose. Here as you see in this particular illustration there are two hot plates I have. They have been preset to the temperatures of 65 and 95 degrees Celsius and each of these steps would have a certain time associated with it. So, the spun coated resist on the wafer would basically brought in and uh, these plates would be used for heating these. Uh, so, that we can get a cured film of the resist on the surface. Basically, close this and uh, just start the spin coating process and uh, uh, 
let the, the, the film that we have set kind of spread over the whole surface and create a thin film which is about 20 to 20 microns, 25 microns of this resist on the surface of the wafer. So now we have to be, now the, the resist is actually spun coated now and we have to be very careful about removing the wafer. Uh, we have to hold it from a thin corner at the sides because that is typically the area where there should not be any designs and structures. We will just use a little bit of tweezer space for holding it and be extremely careful about handling because mind you at this stage the resist is actually a kind of liquid in nature we have not cured and before the curing uh, the film is like tacky and then if you have any stresses or any impact on the film it is going to create a huge difference and make uh, uh, the film not behave properly. Also we need to assert, uh, assert enough, uh, one, one basic fact that uh, the table that we are using for keeping or aligning our hot plate should be perfectly parallel to the ground uh, because otherwise there may be a, a possibility of the resistor running to one side thus creating a thicker film at one end which is highly undesirable because we want a uniformity in the film thickness uh, which also determines the sizes and nature of our structures and features. So essentially now uh, the, uh, the program has stopped and uh, I am going to slowly pull uh, and uh, as you can see here uh, there is a thin film of resist on the top of the surface. I am going to actually take uh, the wafer box here and then slowly use a small amount of space. So in, first thing we need to do is to close the vacuum so that we can decouple the wafer from the spin table. We take a very close, a very small portion and bite along with this uh, tweezer on that portion and then slowly transfer the resist coated surface onto this uh, uh, wafer holding box and then once we have done it, we actually cover it with uh, this, uh, this, this cover here, not press it very tightly and then slowly move towards our next step which is the hot plate and keep it on the 65 degree set hot plate and wait there for about 3 minutes or so. So I am going to put this wafer now on the top of this particular hot plate which has been set at 65 degrees. So for doing that we have to be again very careful about pulling this resist coated wafer out. We use the exact same area as we had used before uh, for holding just in a small uh, edge or a small corner and then keep it on the hot plate. We have a stopwatch with us here. At this particular stage we would like to operate on the stopwatch by setting it at 3 minutes and then uh, starting to operate this uh, and basically the idea is that this will give an alarm at the end of 3 minutes. We need a 3 minute heating time for this particular uh, process step of 65 degrees and then we will go to the next step which is another 3 to 4 minutes on the 95 degrees. So this is, uh, watch is now reading about 19 uh, seconds or so. Now this is actually an alarm system, it would tell you uh, in advance uh, as the time is over, it will have a beeping sound from which uh, you can actually figure out what is the exact time for which the resistor is being heated. Uh, the thing about microfabrication is that you have to be very careful about uh, the exact hold temperatures. This right here is an illustration that the time is over. So what we will do is we will go ahead and pull out the resist now, the resist coated wafer now. Again the same precautions need to be followed, you need to hold the resist uh, from a very uh, you know small corner here and then slowly put it over uh, the, the, the surface that we want to mean uh, want to put it. So I am going to now transfer this resist coated wafer onto this particular surface. It is almost it is always a good idea to actually coat the heated surface or it hold the heated surface at uh, uh, room temperature and let it come back uh, to uh, the particular ambient room temperature for uh, you know the, the film to have uh, least possible undulations and warping is possible. We will just uh, cover it in case uh, there is any dust accumulation on the surface. Uh, another thing I want to uh, point out is that the environment in this uh, in which this coating process is carried out is a very clean environment. Um, we estimate, we, uh, we, we plan to actually do these things typically in clean rooms uh, where uh, the particle contamination uh, may be as low as about uh, close to 1000 ppm or 100 ppm depending on what kind of feature sizes you are using. So essentially we will hold this for uh, some 5-6 minutes till it equilibrates back to the room temperature and then we will actually use the second heating step of 95 degrees uh, and uh, put this resist back again uh, for about 5-6 to six minutes for the full curing action to take place after which we will do the uh, UV exposure of the resist using the mask. So after the, the, the from its, uh, its location and put it over this plate which has been set to a temperature of 95 degrees Celsius. We start on the stopwatch and set it to about 6 minutes time. 
uh, so the, the idea is that you know after six minutes as we uh, hear the second alarm we should be able to pick this up and then again let it equilibrate back to the room temperature before the exposure process. So we are nearing the end of the time that it takes and there is an alarm bell now again. So what we have to do is the same thing, we will pull back the wafer from the surface here and then put it back again on the, you know, use just a small area here to uh, keep, keep the wafer or hold the wafer through the tweezer and then put it back again on its resting place where we will use a little bit of time for equilibrating it back to the room temperature. So uh, we are now ready after this temperature is uh, close to the room temperature to do lithography on this particular wafer. So essentially this is uh, called the photolithography equipment and this is used for exposure of the resist uh, to very characteristic uh, frequency of light mostly in the UV uh, area. Essentially uh, here what you do is to use something called a hard mask which you can see here right here. This is actually a glass chrome mask uh, where you can see uh, very closely if you look at some of these features really are at the micron scale and uh, these have been made using uh, laser etching in a film of chrome that you filled in that this side this particular side which has the coating really sits with the wafer being aligned with the wafer because otherwise if you have uh, the other side sitting in proximity to the wafer there are diffraction effects. If you see the thickness of the mask this is made in a glass uh, plate which is about close to 900 microns or so thick. And so therefore, it is a very good idea uh, to have uh, the metallized surface uh, in proximity to the coded wafer. Uh, 0.9 mm or 900 microns is good enough for a beam of light to get hugely diffracted. Uh, and so therefore, if uh, suppose we were to do the other way around with this side, the glass side sitting on the top of the wafer, the features that we will be typically looking at would be much more in size because of diffraction effects. So, what I am going to do now is to tell you how to use the lithography setup to uh, actually do alignment and exposure. So here uh, we have something called a mask holder which is actually this uh, region here. The mask is really sitting on the top of uh, on the bottom side of this surface uh, of this particular holder and it is actually facing uh, the, the wafer which would be placing somewhere here. This is the wafer stage and the idea is to be able to precisely align uh, the, the, uh, the hard mask over the wafer surface. So in order to do that, what we do is to kind of lose these particular points here. There are four such screws uh, and then slowly pull out this part from the machine and uh, essentially as you see, this really is the surface which holds this particular hard mask. Okay? And uh, there is a stand for... Uh, uh, this uh, application or this uh, this mask loading, uh, you have to put it right in that particular spot. It is like a jig and uh, it ensures that there is no uh, unnecessary toppling or falling down of the mask holder. So you take the hard mask and this has to be pre-cleaned. This of course is a pre-cleaned sample. So what you should normally do is to put uh, liquid uh, uh, compressed nitrogen or compressed air and blow dry it thoroughly so that uh, there are no marks. Suppose there is some uh, finger mark or something which comes on the top. So you could use a small amount of acetone uh, and uh, wet a Kim wipe and then slowly rub over it and then wash it in ethanol and then clean it using dry air, uh, dry nitrogen or compressed air. So what I am going to do is to actually align this mask in its place here and uh, slowly. So there are two, two slots really for that purpose and I am going to actually make it face down. So therefore. Uh, the chromium side has to be facing the wafer surface. So which is actually given by this uh, dark brown region of uh, the mask. So I'm, I slowly put it inside the, uh, the mask holder and uh, then basically this is only a, uh, a, a passive gripping. We need to make it active uh, by using vacuum uh, which can be uh, uh, operated by using this controller or turning on the controller and uh, the controller power on and then actually 
use uh, uh, the wafer holder and uh, the, the mask uh, for the vacuum to be operated onto the mask. Now if you see uh, the mask really is held very firmly. So now we have uh, it actually mounted and uh, well, uh, well connected with the vacuum from the system. So what we do is we take this wafer holder out and it is pretty much uh, firmly gripping to the mask now and there is no possibility of the mask falling as you can see. So we go back into its position here and then try to mount it in a manner so that you can actually bolt this mask holder onto the top of uh, the wafer surface. So there are four bolts for that purpose. You actually uh, uh, try to align them with uh, the, the, the bolt heads which are there on the top of the mask holder and essentially uh, you can actually now um, use the locking mechanism to ensure that they firmly get locked over the wafer surface. So what we do is now actually after mounting this properly, we need to actually bolt it firmly. So we are going to actually use these set of screw heads to uh, ensure that uh, there, there, is a, there is a good contact between the holder and it grips really good on the surface. Okay? So we are going to just uh, ensure uh, proper gripping of, uh, of the holder or the mask holder onto the surface of the stage. The stage is by the by going to move along with this whole uh, mask holder to the exposure zone which is underneath the scope as I will be showing you just in a little bit and uh, it has to be having a tight grip uh, for the purpose of proper alignment uh, with uh, the wafer on the surface. So what we are going to now do is to actually move this exposure stage uh, the scope actually from uh, its current location to uh, near this over the mask holder so that I can have this zone here for wafer loading and unloading free. Okay? And uh, essentially now I take out the wafer and load it on the surface of the chuck which is just here in this particular region. So essentially now what we are going to do is to take the wafer from its box and uh, actually put it in this particular zone here which is meant to do wafer holding. Okay? Again uh, we would like to use vacuum uh, as a means of locking this wafer, the spun coated wafer, resist coated wafer onto the, uh, the ex exposure stage. And this uh, switch right here which says wafer vacuum actually ensures that uh, the, the vacuum is used to pull and lock the wafer. I want to just check in whether the vacuum is working well and I found out that it does not move anymore. The wafer is jammed with respect to the stage and then next step is actually exposure to UV. So in the next step what we do is we actually now align the mask with the wafer by pulling this stage all the way up to uh, its position here, location here and then try to actually manually bolt it, uh, bolt the holder in this place so that it does not move back. Okay? And uh, also uh, what we would need to do here is to actually go ahead and move this microscope stage back for the correct focus. The idea is that the wafer has to be Z displaced so that it can come in contact with the mask surface. And uh, for doing that we also use this scope, this microscope. And there is a small IR beam which is actually uh, you, uh, there is a small red light beam which is actually uh, used for the purpose of seeing whether the wafer is really touching onto the mask surface. And so what we do is in the first stage we move this particular microscope or the scope stage all the way to its position here above the mask and then there is a small lock here which we use for locking. There is also a control here where we can actually turn on uh, the red light uh, which actually is now focused on to the mask and the wafer. And the idea is we should be able to move the various uh, the, the wafer stage okay? and uh, we do it by moving uh, this is the x displacement and really this is the y displacement uh, for the scope. Okay? So the scope can position on a particular area and the wafer stage can be moved by the controls which are there at the bottom here uh, in this particular zone and we can actually move the z displacement and see whether the, the, the feature onto the mask is really in focus. If it is in focus that is an indication that the wafer has touched the mask surface and that is really uh, uh, the spot at which we should do uh, the exposure. It is so fine aligned that if you just go above that focus point or below that focus point it indicates either you are pressing the wafer hard to the mask which means at the cost of damaging the resist or you are going away that means creating a gap between the wafer and the mask surface. 
either event is not good for us. We have to just be able to uh, make a, just a close contact without much pressure onto the resist coated surface. One of the reasons why this kind of alignment systems are also called contact aligners. Uh, so essentially we, I would just like to see through this microscope stage and uh, try to find out if uh, the features etc are close. I see that there is a little bit uh, of displacement uh, which is needed to be done on the z axis so that the, the, align, the images can be correctly focused. Now I think we have really uh, pretty good adjustment and uh, we can do or we are all set to do uh, the exposure. So this right here is also uh, a controller for the exposure time. Uh, if you look at the resist manufacturer sheet it gives the exposure dosage for a certain thickness of the resist film. So what we need to do is to calculate from there using lamp power how much time of exposure is needed for the particular thickness uh, that we are operating. So the, uh, because our thicknesses of the resist are about 20 to 25 microns we can get uh, the correct exposure at the dosage rate that this particular lamp offers in a time of about 20 to 22 seconds. We use this timer setting for uh, achieving that. So you have these different values here in minutes and you can see right now uh, the setting is about 22 seconds here which means that the exposure would be for 22 seconds. So now what we have to do is after all this uh, exposure time setting etc has been done we need to take care of this microscope stage by moving it back because now we also need to do exposure okay. And so essentially I am going to unbolt this whole stage from here and then shift it slightly. Uh, towards the right and in dock it in its position and uh, essentially that is going to give me a, 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 a you know a through pass for the light the UV, uh, UV light to go through the mask and fall onto the wafer surface. So this is now taken care of the mask is there in contact with the wafer and in order to protect the operator there is a UV shield which has to be installed here before doing the exposure and we are all set to do the exposure. So I am going to now actually turn on the exposure light and as you see here the moment I turn it on the timer clock has started and uh, the light the UV light is now falling sharply onto the wafer and essentially uh, this is uh, the time reading here says that is rapidly reaching uh, 22 second mark that we had set before. And the moment that is done this light will go off the exposure light will go off and our exposure process of the photoresist is complete as a matter of fact it is just complete now. Uh, now we have to actually uh, just unload the wafer and the mask separate them together and then we need to go for a post exposure bake step that I will be explaining in the next step. So now I am actually going to go ahead and turn off the exposure system because it has been working for a very long time and uh, now we need to step by step uh, do the processing in a manner that we need to separate uh, the wafer from uh, the mask. So uh, a good way of doing that is to actually go uh, anti clockwise so that the masking stage can go down uh, and uh, I can now take the wafer all the way uh, by losing contact uh, with the mask surface okay. Uh, the next uh, step would be to move or push back uh, the, uh, the particular mask holder all the way back to its uh, resting zone which is uh, close to this end and uh, turn off the wafer vacuum so that I can pull out the wafer uh, and uh, this is actually the exposed wafer which we are pulling out. We will again load it back into its uh, resting place which is this uh, container here right here and uh, we will do something called post exposure bake after this particular step. Uh, so slowly you have to pull out uh, the wafer from its stage now it has been released vacuum is no longer holding it and you actually slowly take it and put it back into its uh, wafer box cover it so that uh, there is not much dust uh, contamination on the surface and close it and set up uh, the, the microscope back to its place uh, here. We also need to just reverse the sequence to pull out the mask. We need to just uh, switch off uh, the wafer holder as well as uh, the mask vacuum and uh, essentially need to just pull back. Uh, the mask uh, in the pretty much similar manner as we had loaded it uh, before okay. So these bolts need to be tie un untied so that they lose grip on the top of this wafer holder slowly move the holder back in its place okay.
and keep it back here and essentially move off the mask as we had done before and uh, store the mask in its place in its box right here and all we can also put this holder back in its place uh, so that the machine is ready for the next run. So as the system is turned off, the next stage is basically to take this wafer and do post exposure bake. And one of the reasons why that needs to be done is that this really is a heat catalyzed process. Uh, if I put the exposed wafer in uh, room temperature conditions and uh, keep it for a longer time, uh, there would be a slow protonation in the exposed areas which would create really the um, opening of the epoxy chains and cross bonding in the areas which are exposed. However, I would like to fasten this process so that the overall time uh, duration for which the lithography uh, is completed is lower and for that we need heat based catalysis of the process. And so doing this uh, what we really uh, need to do is to actually take this wafer back to our heating station and then uh, there are again manufacturer specifications of the resist which talks about how many minutes we need to uh, post exposure heat or bake this using the hot plate at the two temperature conditions that we had done before. So I'm going to now actually pull out this exposed wafer coated with water resist uh, as we did in the last step and uh, slowly put it on the top of this uh, uh, essentially this uh, hot plate and uh, the time here that we give or allow it to be heated for at the 65 degrees uh, step is about one minute. We turn on uh, the stop clock and essentially wait for the alarm bell to go in so that uh, we know that we have heated for the time cycle that was supposed to be. Again we have to equilibrate it to a room temperature condition and then put it back into the 95 degree step so that we can have uh, undulated properly exposed and cured for the resist film. So time is up really now and so we should whatever we, we are wanting to actually take it back again put it uh, back into its resting place again and then wait up till this. Uh, equilibrates to the room temperature and uh, go back do a 6 minutes heating step in the next uh, temperature step that is 95 degrees Celsius. Okay, so basically now we actually put it back onto this uh, wafer surface uh, onto this hot plate surface which is set at 95 degrees Celsius and essentially we heat this for about 6 minutes or so. And uh, one thing very uh, good about this process is that if you look at closely you could really see the features uh, coming up on the surface as you are heating uh, using this uh, 94 degrees. Essentially the points which are uh, uh, slightly uh, miscontrasted uh, uh, you, can, you can see the uh, different contrast there in the zone which is exposed. When you develop it using a developer solution those are typically the zones which remain back and the remaining portions which were unexposed would go away and uh, that is essentially what a negative tone resist. Uh, is supposed to do on the wafer surface. So we are going to now pick up this wafer uh, from this particular place and you know we have now completed more or less uh, the whole uh, exposure and uh, post exposure baking steps and uh, essentially we are now ready for uh, the next step in the process which is developing okay and this developing is important because uh, Essentially, uh, uh, this actually leads to uh, the the the, uh, the features really getting generated uh, within the surface. So I'm going to just uh, take this wafer to the fume hood, and uh, there is already a developer solution uh, which is actually uh, already placed in the fume hood. Uh, there is a certain time for development which the resist manufacturer specifies, uh, uh, and this again is a function of thickness of the particular resist as we our thicknesses are in the range of 20 to 25 uh, microns. So the, uh, the resist maker specifies the developing time uh, for this particular thickness which is about which is about 4 to 5 minutes in our case. So let us actually try to develop it 
Another important point that I would like to mention is that uh, the resist which is actually left over uh, onto the surface while this developing is taking place and it is unexposed kind of uh, turns white or cloudy uh, as you spray isopropanol. So, development process is really um, after the whole time duration is over, it is uh, it's, uh, an iterative process where you kind of spray the isopropanol on the top of this surface again and again and see if there is a cloudy or milkiness associated with the, uh, the surface. Any, any resist which is left over which is uh, unexposed would definitely turn milky and cloudy. So, you have to see when uh, by pouring isopropanol you do not get this cloudiness anymore which also means that your development process is complete and uh, that gives you the best resolution of the features uh, that uh, you are looking at on the surface. So, one thing we have to also uh, take care of in this case is that uh, you cannot just simply drop the wafer uh, on into the developer, uh, you have to keep on stirring the developer solution from time to time. So, that there is no accumulation of the, uh, the resist which is coming off, uh, unexposed resist which is coming off at one particular place. The idea is to keep on dissolving it by swirling the fluid which is over it in a, uh, in a particular manner. So, I am going to do that and then after 4 uh, seconds I am going to also uh, spray isopropanol uh, uh, to see whether uh, this uh, resist that uh, uh, we have done is actually totally developed or not and uh, essentially I start the time now this set to about 4 uh, seconds and then we keep on giving some swirls to this uh, developing action and essentially uh, you have to ensure that this happens so that you get good features onto the surface. So, as you can see here in this particular case after the developing is happening immediately after you put it into the developer uh, the features kind of nicely and beautifully get generated. Uh, we need to do a proper microscopic analysis later on, but this really is the success of the process. It means that whatever you have exposed uh, is essentially keeping there the resistors all cross bonded and the remaining portion has been removed and essentially again you have to keep uh, circulating this and spraying isopropanol from time to time uh, to see whether uh, uh, you know everything is remaining on the surface. Okay, so, I am going to put this for the first time and see uh, this uh, is another beaker that we have uh, put here for spraying isopropanol to see. Uh, Let us pull this out and uh, this bottle right here is really the the, the isopropanol. So, I am going to see this, uh, I see that uh, there is some clouding action which has happened, uh, which means that uh, resist is still present, undeveloped resist is still present. I put it back into the solution and again uh, try to just uh, give it a few turns and see. So, this process keeps on going on for the stipulated time and uh, at the end of the process you will have really sharp distinguished features which uh, come out the process. Okay, so, basically we had uh, in our earlier experiment uh, developed this wafer, this piece of wafer and uh, essentially now whatever was there on this mask has been transferred uh, onto this wafer using the process of photolithography. And since uh, in, in essentially um, this is not the end of uh, uh, the process because we really need to measure and calibrate and be able to see uh, the microscopic features that have been imprinted on the top of the resist which we will be using later for our purposes. And for doing that we need um, um, something which can create a high magnification object. So, in our laboratory here we have this microscope, it is actually a uh, inverted fluorescence microscope, but it does have an option of um, being able to image using the bright field, dark field. Uh, imaging regime and uh, essentially the, this microscope is from Nikon. Um, uh, there are certain manufacturers of these optical devices, they are precise. Uh, this needs to be rested on um, a vibration free table as you can see and I would like to describe uh, at the very outset a little bit about this microscope and how we do the imaging modality. So, here in this particular uh, zone these are also known as the objectives. Okay. So, essentially they are nothing but uh, lenses and uh, they all have the capability of magnifying in different uh, capacities. So, we do have objectives varying from 4 x which means that the image which is actually seen uh, through the microscope is 4 times the actual size of the object all the way to about 150 x. Okay. So, essentially there are about uh, 6 objectives here. 
uh, the way that this microscope operates uh, is pretty simple. You have an illumination source which is at the background which is actually a UV source. It passes through a set of um, ND filters, neutral density filters which would cut off the UV light into different uh, uh, intensities. And then finally, the cutoff light at a much lower intensity reaches this portion of the microscope which has uh, what you know as filter cubes. So, I like to explain what these filter cubes really do. Essentially, if you look at uh, uh, the way that the filter cubes are assembled, uh, these cubes uh, have um, you know um, two basically they are, they are cubes which have two uh, filters essentially. What are filters? Filters are essentially uh, pieces of glasses uh, which are designed to cut off certain frequencies and let certain frequencies of light go past it. So, in this particular uh, uh, filter cube as you see, there is an emission filter which is uh, situated at the top. There is an excitation filter which is actually situated here and then we have something called a dichroic mirror which is just placed in between uh, this cube in a uh, 45 degrees angle. The purpose of this filter is essentially to take off the necessary unnecessary frequencies from the UV. Uh, as I told you this microscope also has a capability of doing fluorescence measurements. Uh, it is almost uh, always important to be able to um, excite a certain dye with a certain wavelength of light. Let us say we have a dye which is excitable in the range of uh, 390 nanometers wavelength. So, I should have something some cutoff mechanism where all the different components of the UV which are coming from the illumination source to this filter should get cut off uh, except the 390 plus minus maybe about 20 nanometers. So, it is which is also known as a dichroic mirror which is placed inside this filter cube probably it is not visible uh, from outside. But uh, the, the way that that uh, mirror operates is also based on this cutoff principle. So, uh, there may be a cutoff wavelength uh, beyond which uh, the, uh, the, filter, the dichroic mirror may be able to refract the light and below which it should be able to reflect the light. So, that is uh, how these mirrors are typically designed. Okay. Now, uh, uh, with this combination in mind let us look at what is the optics. So, this particular filter as you are seeing here is going to face uh, the UV light and it is going to take off uh, the per particular portion which is unimportant and send or transmit the portion which is necessary for the particular fluorophore. Now, each of these fluorophores are designed uh, for a certain frequency okay. and uh, essentially they have an emission frequency range and an excitation frequency range. So, whatever uh, cutoff we use should correspond to the excitation frequency of the fluorophore. Once this uh, particular uh, portion of light comes in the filter, it uh, is reflected of the dichroic mirror which is now placed at a 45 degrees angle and actually goes down this uh, filter cube to the objective. Okay. So, you have light beam coming from this end uh, cutting uh, a portion of it through the filter and then uh, the cutoff portion which is necessary portion goes and falls on to the 45 degrees mirror which is placed in the center of the cube and it goes reflected uh, through the mirror because that is the property of the dichroic. Okay. So, let us say we are uh, trying to cut off uh, 390 plus minus 10 nanometers uh, wave length band. So, essentially we use a filter uh, so that uh, the, the particular package or the part of the package of light which comes out of the filter is from 380 to about 400 nanometers. And uh, let us say we have a dichroic mirror which cuts off at 590 which means that anything below 590 is reflected of the mirror and anything above 590 is refracted of the mirror and it goes past the mirror. So, now uh, just because the reflected beam <coughs> goes down it actually passes through this lower end of the filter cube and uh, reaches through the objective onto the sample. This right here is the sample stage. It is an x y z precisely moving stage uh, which is capable of uh, positioning the sample with respect to the objective and uh, we can actually maneuver over the sample and see the portion of the zone which we want to focus and image. So, essentially when the light goes and strikes the sample surface and there is a fluorophore, there is an emanation 
of a certain frequency which is the emission frequency of the particular fluorophore. Now, this frequency actually would come back from the objective and come through this hit the mirror and here as you see the dichroic does its job again. In this case because of the stoke shift the wavelength that is generated by the fluorescence is actually higher on the higher side. And so, suppose we have a fluorophore which generates a uh, an emission frequency in the range of 620 nanometers maybe, which is above the 590 cutoff um, uh, that is provided by the dichroic. So, what the light beam which is going to come from the fluorophore through the objective is going to do is to go past the mirror in the refraction mode and essentially you can pick it up using this other filter here which can further streamline it to the band that we are looking at. So, anything above 590 is sent out and then we are trying to identify let us say a 620 plus minus 10 nanometers which is about 610 to 630 nanometers uh, region or band of the wavelength which actually comes out and comes through the objective onto the eyepiece and that is how you get the image. Now, in a bright field dark field option particularly for lithography the problem that we face is that we cannot uh, image these uh, silicon wafers which are trans uh, uh, which, which are actually opaque using uh, an inverted mechanism of light in glass samples, glass holders or transparent or translucent samples that is still possible. There is a light source here in the microscope which is uh, actually white light as you can see which can go past the sample surface if the sample is kept at this particular state. However, in our case if I put the silicon and the silicon is opaque the light will not be able to go past. So, this is really not the imaging modality we are looking at. So, what we use is this principle of filter cubes and uh, essentially we just remove the filters from both ends. So, therefore, it is just plain light which we are actually looking at for exciting and whatever is reflected off is captured and uh, essentially we can actually design the dichroic mirror in a manner that it actually gives only uh, in the visible region of the spectrum. Okay? And so, typically uh, we can see a mixed coloration probably white light which is reflected off um, the surface of this wafer and which comes out and gives uh, a, a good feeling about what the image is on uh, the particular sample. Now, what the objective would also do is to try to blow up the image and make it well magnified and this is very essential for micro features. We are looking at let us say a 26 microns feature or uh, let us say a 50 microns feature as uh, we probably know uh, you know all of you probably by now know that uh, the human hair itself is about 100 microns. So, we are talking about a half of that size or we are talking sometimes about one tenth of that size. So, it is not very easy to visualize until you really magnify it to a certain extent and this is the tool which is used to do that. So, with this uh, background in mind let us go ahead and uh, try to do some imaging on uh, the resist that we had actually processed uh, that day. And so, essentially I would like to close this filter cube and uh, I would like to tell you now about how uh, the image processing can actually be done using uh, this particular uh, imaging system. Okay? So, I am also going to show you now how uh, we acquire these images digitally of course, through the, the eyepiece this is also known as the eyepiece through which the image can be seen uh, because it is closer to the human eye that is why we call it eyepiece. And uh, essentially uh, what I am also what I am now going to describe is the way that we can digitally acquire these images and electronically sent it so that we can have digital photographs. So, uh, one of the options that is available to us in this particular scope is uh, this unit right here which is also a charge coupled device a CCD camera and essentially again this is uh, uh, probably the finest form of miniaturization that can happen uh, using microelectronic processing technology. So, essentially uh, whatever light intensity is uh, uh, allowed past the, the, the dichroics and the filters actually goes past this uh, tube here and uh, there is a small Peltier cooled CCD chip which uh, has th thousands of these or millions of these pixels. Uh, which are independent devices. So, the idea is as the intensity falls on these devices the intensity of the light there is a transduction process there is a generation of electrons from the photon and uh, uh, that gives you a signal okay, that gives you an aspect about what is the intensity what are the different uh, textural profiles from which the light has been reflected and that uh, can be reconstructed simply to make what you call the real image. Uh, of course, the magnification is done at the outset here by the objective of the particular object. Okay. So, 
uh, the light goes past into the CCD here, the charge coupled device here and electronically transfers, the data electronically transfers through this data cable as you are seeing to uh, a computer which is placed uh, right over. So, uh, the data which is collected here electronically goes past this data cable all the way up to this computer here that you can see and essentially in this computer uh, we do have a reader software uh, which uh, actually uh, also is able to acquire the data from uh, the charge coupled device on the microscope and uh, read it on this frame digitally uh, using uh, uh, this particular software. So, uh, we have a licensed version of the software called Image Pro which is used to identify uh, the signal responses from uh, the CCD camera and essentially uh, I am just in about few minutes going to demonstrate how we can read out using the IPs and how we can see here. Now, uh, the advantage that the software also offers is that we do have a scaling mechanism here where by feeding uh, the particular scale factor, the magnification factor, we are able to generate um, a cursor which can give you dimensions as you join different points on the same image. So, essentially uh, I am going to describe this whole operation by starting with our sample which is the spun coded exposed uh, and uh, developed of the microscope stage. This right here is the XYZ stage. So, I am going to actually go ahead and just simply place this wafer on the stage and kind of approximately center it. This being a bigger wafer, we do not have a clamping mechanism here. But uh, essentially now, what I am going to do is to actually uh, take this filter set to number 4 option, which is actually uh, the bright field option here. And I already described what bright field would mean essentially. And then I am going to actually turn on the shutter, so that the light starts falling on uh, uh, the wafer surface uh, here through the 4 x objective. My goal now is to look into the eyepiece <coughs> and uh, see uh, how this image is being visualized on the top of this wafer. And yes, I can actually now see the images uh, very cleanly uh, which have come from the resist and I am going to actually uh, transmit this data onto the CCD screen for the for your advantage, so that you can see it. And uh, I am going to now also position uh, the wafer in, in, in an area uh, where we can really have a good grasp and we can also have a scaling etcetera. So, this right here I have now a very well focused object. I just change the focus a little bit and see if I can go any better. Uh, I think uh, it's pretty is probably uh, is probably now uh, very well focused onto the area. The way that you focus uh, these things is by lifting the stage up and down and going in the z direction. You have a lever here and corresponding knob on the other side here, which you can rotate clock or anti clockwise for the z displacement to happen in the positive or the negative direction. And uh, you what you need here is actually to look into the scope into the eyepiece and see that corresponding to what z distance is the image contrast uh, the maximum, the image resolution the maximum. You will see that above a critical distance if you go any further the image becomes blurry. Similarly, below that distance if the image you know becomes it becomes blurry again. Uh, so, therefore, we need to really ascertain the right z level uh, for uh, the correct focus uh, to happen in this particular case. Okay. Now, I am going to actually transmit and uh, use the CCD camera to acquire what is there for your benefit, so that you can see what you did or what we did in our last uh, experiment on photolithography. So, uh, for that what we need is basically try to uh, use this lever to uh, open the shutter for this particular camera. Now, there are uh, three options in this particular lever as you can find out and this lever can actually come out and uh, go back in right. So, essentially uh, when the lever is actually in its inward position, it only exposes the eyepiece and you can only see the image, but you cannot really see it through the CCD camera. But if you are actually able to push it all the way to uh, the, mo the most outward position for this lever, uh, in, in that particular uh, position you can only expose the CCD camera uh, and cut off the eyepiece. So, you cannot see anything anymore by this eyepiece. 
So, I am going to now transmit. So, now this uh, the lever being in this position whatever is reflected off the surface of the wafer is getting transmitted through this CCD camera into the computer. And I am now going to actually uh, look at this image using the software so that you can also have a grasp on that. So, we had earlier opened the image pro software. So, what I am going to do here is to go to this acquire menu and there are different options here in this particular software. The first option mentions video slash digital capture. So, we actually are able to, so our purpose here is to get uh, a digital image although uh, the capabilities of the systems are also uh, to get real movies uh, particularly in uh, real time cases uh, where you may be capturing particles or you may be uh, doing a reaction etcetera uh, within, within a small architecture. So, uh, the capabilities of this particular microscope are enormous. So, what I am going to do is to actually ask this microscope to digitally capture. And so, there is a menu which has been opened here, it is called the Q imaging menu and you have different options in this menu including um, the exposure preview, the exposure acquisition and uh, essentially you can also have a auto calculating option for the intensity. So, that you can get a good grasp of the image. Uh, so, I would actually be able to first see the preview here from this option and if I click on it as you see this is really the image uh, that I was wanting you guys to see. This is something that we have developed using photolithography onto the surface of the wafer. Now, I uh, will be doing the dimensioning part just about in a little bit, but what we need to do is to actually suppose there is out of focus or in focus, you can actually change the focusing stage on the microscope as I told you and be able to get a very good fake focus on these images. Now, this is probably one of the best fo foci that one can get using these images because I have already calibrated it using the eyepiece. Okay. Now, I am going to actually store this image. So, I go to the snap option here and automatically uh, a photograph is generated uh, here as you can see which actually gives you a digital image of what has been captured from the CCD camera. Now, uh, regarding the scaling option uh, this uh, actually a uh, very easy uh, way out to do scaling. Uh, so, what I am going to do is to actually uh, see what uh, magnification we are using for this uh, particular image and as you uh, may recall the magnification that we had used was 4 x. So, this image is 4 times the actual size of the image that is there uh, on uh, the feature right. So, I am going to actually uh, go ahead and uh, use the calibration tool. So, you go to this option called measure, uh, there is a calibration option and then I also want to somehow uh, ask the software to identify that scale at which uh, the image is being processed. So, the magnification value has to be put in the software for it to tell what really would be the actual image size. So, whatever sizes it is getting in terms of pixels on this uh, uh, Im digital image would be uh, converted by dividing uh, by a factor of 4. So, that the actual sizes can be obtained. So, I am going to actually go ahead and ask the system uh, the or give the system the magnification. So, it is providing a standard magnification of 10 x which has been the set value, but ours is 4 x. So, we go to this drop down menu and actually go ahead and see uh, or input uh, the reference calibration and make it 4 x and let the system understand uh, it is 4 x. And then <coughs> we have an option here uh, of scale uh, which is actually uh, having a text box which says measure lengths and distances in the particular image. So, I click on this option and a scale comes up and then I am actually going to use the cursor and connect two points uh, from end to end to see what distances it would be talking about. So, let us say if I click on this edge of the image here right here and go and click on this image edge here in this particular area, this distance is corresponding to about 127. 0.9 microns. Okay. So, 0.9 is actually relevant. So, let us say it is about 128 microns. So, this way we can actually get a very good feel of what the actual uh, you know distances would be. So, let us say we want to just connect this two points here on the small uh, you know this small uh, arch this piece uh, here. So, this is corresponding to about 37 uh, microns. So, essentially you can actually measure say from here to here in this particular figure this corresponds to about 187 microns. So, you can actually very accurately and precisely measure uh, the size of what has been generated. And mind you this 37 microns is only one third 
the human here a dimension. So, it is a real small entity to be seen with normal eyes, but this powerful imaging system or modality that we have enables us to actually see and measure what we have done. So, essentially I would like to actually go ahead and look at other areas and, and uh, let us actually save this image. So, uh, we save uh, changes to untitled. So, we actually save uh, by going to this uh, snap option. So, we take this as a snap because you know we have done the measurements here. So, even this needs to be snapped for saving properly. So, we snap it and then go to file and save this as a certain let us say experimental experiment photolithography 1. Okay and uh, use the save option here. So, this has been saved in the desktop. Uh, we can go access it uh, by just uh, looking at this particular image here. It has been saved and you can see that this image exactly uh, is the same as we had uh, done before, okay? saved before. So, we can save these uh, images digitally and use them uh, to our advantage. So, what I am going to now do is to actually use a different area on the wafer and uh, would like to show that how uh, or what all features are there on the wafer surface. Okay. So, I again uh, <coughs> basically uh, go to the acquire mode and uh, use the video digital capture okay. and uh, now I am going to go and uh, essentially do the preview mode. Uh, you can see this is what we had done before and I am going to move off and uh, let this shift to different places and you can see what all has been written in this particular you know domain. So, let us actually go to a different area of the wafer. Let us say we are talking about these channel like regions here. Okay. So, these are essentially the circular channel like regions. Uh, let us we I would I am interested to find out what is the width of one of these. So, these are actually trenches as you can see in the resist and let us see what the width of one of this particular uh, feature would be. So, we again snap uh, the, the image based on this put it somewhere down here and then again do the calibration by selecting spatial scale and calibrating it to 4 x. Mind you uh, the, the system actually gets back to the default 10 x every time we take a new image. So, we have to actually be careful of feeding the exact magnification factor that we are using. We have not changed. So, we are using the 4 x. So, we make it calibrated. Again, we go to the scale option and let us look at the size of one of these channels. So, this size really is about 125 microns. Okay. So, essentially let us also look at one of these edges, how these edges would look like. So, they are again close to about that uh, same 133, so 125 or 133 microns. So, around 125 to 130 microns domain. So, there are some other areas on the wafer. Uh, Let us actually do the same option again to save it. Uh, we go to the snap tool and uh, essentially save this file and make it experiment photolithography 2 option. Okay. So, we make uh, 2 here and save this image, uh, close this particular image here. Okay, and uh, then let us go to a different area on the wafer and look at some other options. So, if you look at something is written here uh, on the on the resist okay, and uh, let us look at a different spot where it may be a little uh, visible in a little better sense. We have to probably do some focusing in order to see what is actually written here and uh, let us actually focus, this is going out of focus, back to focus here and so it is something like uh, the inverted image of what was there on the mask is uh, probably I can see this is the inverted C, this is the inverted E, inverted I, S and uh, in this particular domain let us actually shift the wafer a little bit so that we can uh, exactly see what is uh, on this. Okay. So, we actually move this wafer 
just about a little bit. You can develop a thin film of metal onto such a resist and then remove the areas where uh, the resist was cross bonded or remain or uh, unbonded or remaining. So, therefore, when that resist comes off, it takes off the metal also and the places of the vias or trenches or capillaries which you have opened in between where the silicon was exposed, the metal stays back and you can use these technique for developing thin interconnects um, on um, chips, especially in microelectronic uh, chips. Uh, you can communicate electronically between two um, such islands or posts by having several um, 20 microns or 25 microns wires running in between and uh, uh, this gives you a tremendous um, advantage which can be used for sensing uh, diagnostics, signal transduction so on and so forth. So, uh, so basically photolithography can be considered to be one of the fundamental processes associated uh, the first steps processes associated in realizing something at the micron scale. Thank you.